Tom, welcome to B2B Content Strategist. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks, Amy. Lovely to be here. I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. As I've been doing research into next thing and in your content, I'm very much looking forward to this. Oh no, I didn't know you'd done uh, done preparation. <laughs> of course, yeah, I've got to do the due diligence. <laughs> um, please, could you summarise your role and a few sentences about what next thing does as well? Yeah, of course. So I am the director here of content, PR, and digital. The team includes writers, content strategist, a videographer, PR communications team, and a digital advertising specialist as well. So it's quite a, it's a fairly eclectic remit, I suppose, in terms of what we produce and do. Um, in terms of, uh, in terms of next thing, um, in terms of like framing them, for, particularly for like a non-IT audience, I always feel like the biggest cliche in the whole world at the moment is category creation. Do you yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You hear it and you just... You hear it and your soul sags. I don't know about you. But that said, we did invent a category and it's a genuine category. It's a category that now Forrest to talk about and Gartner talk about, and it's called digital employee experience. And it is, it is actually quite interesting, quite relevant, and um, a, 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 indeed increasingly a big deal. Um, what it denotes is um, you know, the, the, the digital element of employee experience, which is, of course, your your relationship to your technology as an employee, your experience of technology, the way it helps or hinders your productivity, your communication, your collaboration, and your overall sense of employee experience. The term was coined by NextThink originally, and now it's something that Gartner expressly talks about and uses as, as their, you know, in, in their vernacular, DEX, digital employee experience, for us to call it um, EUEM. And uh, so, and, but we are uh, within two successive Forrester waves as the leader. So it is, it is a, as you can imagine, when you, when you think about its significance, it's, it's a genuine, impactful category. And we did actually invent it. So even if there's a lot of bogus category creation out there, it doesn't apply to us. Amy. Okay. And what, so specifically, what do you, what are your offering? So what do your typical clients look like and what, what are you doing with them, those clients, those customers? Yeah, large enterprises, um, and um, you know it, it's B two B software, um, it's IT software, and basically, and we have a situation at the moment where, if you work in IT, on the one hand, due to you know particularly in the post pandemic workplace, you know technology has never been a bigger, more important constituent part of everybody's work experience. Um, you know the stakes for IT for technological failure are incredibly high. The, the impact on um, employee satisfaction, customer satisfaction, et cetera, et cetera, is inestimable. Simultaneously, with the growth of SaaS, with the complexity of the, of the hybrid workplace, with just endless complexity in general coming with technology and with consumer expectations getting higher and higher and creating that complexity in turn, employee expectations, which are tied to their expectations as technology consumers, it's never been harder to, to monitor and to know what people's experience is. So what next thing basically does is it, is it compresses all of that employee experience, the actual experience your employees are having, it, it compresses it, it presents it in a very visually rich, accessible, sensible way. It allows them to, you to make sort of macro tweaks and changes to, to, to make sure everybody is, is flowing properly, the incidents aren't happening, the incidents aren't escalating and really get ahead of any problems that could get in the way of people's working day. It also lets IT communicate directly one-on-one -on -one through the monitors with employees to, to either address an issue, help them through an issue, or indeed just to like survey them and see how satisfied they are with the service that, they, that they're receiving. So, um, I, you know, for that, for that reason, um, it's been in, in hyper growth as a, as an organization for many years, it's got hundreds of, um, very famous, um, customers. And, um, and it's quite magical technology. You typically, when we get it in front of a prospect, they, they jump at it. And that's the chat. Is, you know, it's sold. Sure yes, indeed. Yeah. yeah. So as obviously you mentioned your director of content, digital marketing and PR, and you, you briefly touched on this, but like, what does your team look like? Yeah. In terms of like what we produce, I could kind of do it from that direction as well. Right. Yeah. Great. We have a, we have a something called it. We have a thought leadership platform an express thought leadership platform called the Dex hub that we launched around two years ago now. 
um, and that's where we uh, that's quite vendor neutral. And because we are the with the inventors of the category of this category of decks, we are the, we remain the dominant voice in the category, the market leader in the category. So we really wanted to make sure we had an ability to build community, to communicate um, our insight. And, uh, and to continue to lead it, right? Once something becomes more renowned, it becomes a much more competitive space. And we didn't want to surrender our position on that side. So we launched the Dex Hub a couple of years ago. We have the Dex Show, which is the podcast that I co-host with my partner, Tim Flower. And um, then we, uh, that's sort of, uh, and then within that, we have various sort of interactive assets and initiatives, which are all kind of expressly about thought leadership, community building, innovation around content. And then, of course, we produce a lot of reports, surveys, ebooks. Um, we produced an actual book last year. We had the, the, the Dummies Guide to Dex by the part of a Wiley series. Um, and, um, and of course, we, we, have a, we have a website, we have a YouTube channel, we make videos, we make demos, we, and we collaborate with a lot of people in product marketing and across the, across the department and indeed the company to support them on their content needs as well. And as I mentioned already, we have a, we have a, a paid digital specialist and, and a PR team. Um, so we work, we cover our PR bases in, in, in US, UK and, and worldwide with them. And um, we work with the demand gen and our digital advertising specialist to make sure we distribute our content and, and, and contribute to pipeline and create interest at the same time. I mean, you, you do loads, don't you? Like I, as I said, I was looking at everything before we talked and as you said that there's so much content that you guys are creating is there a particular priority or focus for this year for 2023 you mentioned the the podcast but then you see as you said the videos the white papers the book the ebook and everything is there a, is there a specific focus there absolutely is yeah yeah and it, so it's very interesting so what happened through the pandemic is everything that next thing could been talking about at a marketing high level if you will around decks around this category itself really kind of fulfilled itself right because suddenly this argument that digital employee experience was a hugely significant factor of employee experience became absolutely unignorable because suddenly the the, the traditional fulcrum of employee experience the office disappeared for a few months and, and, and even years you know suddenly it became completely irrelevant and our laptops and our devices became our workplace. What you found then is, is suddenly there was a, a big movement between HR and IT departments coming closer together. We found a lot of customers were, were using our tech, HR departments and our customers' companies were using our technology in order to communicate with employees, to survey them on their well-being, post-remote post work, and of course, you know, a, a digital interruption. A problem was going to be much more significant when you didn't have, you couldn't go and knock on a, an IT's door in your office. You know, you have to make sure you got ahead of these incidents. And of course, if you couldn't use your devices, you could, literally couldn't work. There was nothing else. You could even have a meeting. You couldn't do anything at all. Simultaneously, you have a phenomenon of the great resignation, um, a very, a very real thing, as we all know, right? So employee power, you know, and the, the need to retain talent and use any weapons at your disposal to, to reward talent and retain it and uh, make, keep people productive and motivated was, was an absolute priority. So that became a priority for a lot of the IT teams that we work with, a lot of our customers and a lot of prospects who are coming to us. So suddenly a lot of our marketing was kind of organically absorbed into this kind of, um, into the wider zeitgeist, you know, this was a natural thing for us to talk about more than ever and really underscore. Suddenly, though, you have, you have, of course, you have a post-pandemic workplace where um, I think that to a degree, things have re resumed a more normal composition. There's a lot more people going, to, going back to the office, et cetera. There's much more normal circumstances. Simultaneously, there's been so, so much kind of a concern about recession and the, the, the economic well-being in general that there was a, there's a real need to get down, back down to brass tacks, you know, to help uh, our salespeople demonstrate the value and utility of a product itself and hone in on, on what the product does and how it helps the prospects and how it helps the customers and to, to, to be a little bit less highfalutin. Simultaneously, however, we have invented this category and the category isn't going anywhere. As I said, we just, Gartner are talking about it, Forrester are talking about it. We can't, we can't afford to, to surrender our leadership 
and our thought leadership in this category. So we, we kind of have had to sort of, um, split our focus a bit, open up a new front in, in, in just, uh, being very, very pragmatic and direct, but make sure we don't sacrifice any of our leadership at the same time. So big focus on sales enablement type content, but also the thought leadership and leading that category. You mentioned the digital employee experience show podcast that you have and that that sits on the DEX hub. So it's separate to your main website. You've created this, this hub. What was the thinking behind that in terms of deciding whether to put it on your website or create something very separate? Because it reminds me of the conversation I had with Tyler Massard at Vidyard and they have sales feed which is their content that is just sitting on a completely separate platform to their website that community building without a specific focus against a company and it reminded me when I saw yours Dex Hub seemed quite similar to what they did be really keen to know why why that decision was made on hosting it there and creating a separate site yeah yeah of course um yeah I think the the, the main strategic reason for it um, from leadership to want this kind of aut- almost autonomous for leadership form was precisely the growth of the category that we've created and the and the need to retain our place within it. You know, once you coin something, you're immediately a thought leader as much as you are a competitor in the space. And I think once that space becomes highly competitive, it can really, really value you to make sure you'll continue to be perceived as innovative and authoritative and objective. That was a main focus of having a sort of standalone site. It is a standalone site and you will find the content there is almost impeccably vendor neutral. Certainly it's objective. Nonetheless, it doesn't, it doesn't hide itself. You know, it is proudly affiliated and, and ran, ran by next thing. And we use it to host a lot of customers and influencers and thought leaders that we're connected to and we're very conscious that everybody that does so is is promoting our brand and validating our brand particularly if they're a customer and we did feel that we hoped that having this kind of more um authentic objective and and vendor neutral space would encourage our customers to feel more comfortable about talking about their successes and their experience and i i I feel that has, has come to pass you know that's very, I think in a way, the podcast that we mentioned is, is even more effective there as a, as a vehicle for that kind of conversation, but the two totally have complemented one another and allowed us to work with customers in, in ways we wouldn't have other, otherwise been able, if it was just like, would you like to appear on our blog? Would you like to do a webinar and kind of more traditional customer marketing approaches? I think it, it clearly is working and it's a really good technique to follow when, like you said, you are at the forefront of developing you've created this category and now you're continuing to lead it so yeah the vendor neutral platform we've we've obviously like the clear links to um next thing makes sense and it, it looks really good in terms of the content that you're creating so obviously you've mentioned you guys are creating lots of really high quality content on that platform and your website as well and um, it's a very topical question but is there any ways that you've incorporated things like a chat gpt and um, ai into your content uh, work stream i know obviously as a platform you'll have ai integrated into into the platform itself but from a content team a marketing team is it featuring any workflows in terms of production in terms of production i you know i sometimes suspect our writers are doing it on the qt and just, and just not telling us and we were we were in a call the other <laughs> i i just if they do listen to this i know you're not really and if you are that's as long as it's working. As as it's yeah, working. exactly. If you're not spotting no, it's it. Not a point. It's not a moral thing, right? But um, if they did, I'm, sh- I'm sure they'd say. But um, I remember we were, we were on a call the other day about an annual global event series. It's a tool we do of customers and prospects around the world. We do Paris, New York, London, and, um, and Frankfurt every year. It's called the Experience Everywhere Tour. And uh, we were, you know, trying to frame and think about our, uh, our topics and titles for the year. And somebody had just uh, turned up for a meeting armed with a, a list of uh, chat GPT suggestions. Um, what I think, what, what, one thing I do think is funny, I mean, so it's been a huge theme in the content we've made. Partly because, as you, as you alluded to, um, uh, NextThink uses and incorporates some AI in its technology. But a lot of what AI generally does in terms of automating and facilitating greater efficiency and action for, for employees, whatever they're doing, 
it, it's kind of what Nextfink does anyway, right? It's like it, 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 on math is what it's what the technology does. Like, uh, so there's a lot of relevancy and a lot of relevant talking points. And, uh, you know, as in any industry, there is anxiety in the audience about what AI and related technologies could mean for the future of their profession. Yeah. So there's lots of opportunities to engage constructively, often reassuringly, and just generally kind of like feed that curiosity with, with, with a lot of relevant content. And what I think I find in a content team is partially because like chat GPT just landed right on the sort of content creation space, didn't it? That's kind of what it's doing is there is a degree of understandable hostility or wariness to that function and what it seems to threaten with. And of course, there's a lot of opportunities for making things quicker or more efficient. I also feel like one of the things that ChatGPT highlights is I can't help but feel personally that the more that written content doesn't need to be made by individual content creators, the less people will be interested in consuming written content. I, my suspicion is we will feel in general, certainly this generation and like current generations will feel a degree of increased disinterest and hostility to being fed things by artificial intelligence. We will look for the human being behind content. And I think what that means in the medium term is that content becomes more diversified beyond written content. It's a process we see happening anyway, where with podcasting, with videos, the human influence, at least at present, remains uh, more conspicuous, you know, and more at the front. Of the, of, a, of a kind of consumption experience, right? Um, now, it could well change in short time. You know, that's what it looks like when we see what's coming. But at the moment, if you're, you're listening to a person talk, you know, more than you necessarily know that you're, you're reading a person's written words. As a content team, nobody is in our team is just a writer anyway. Everybody participates on the podcast. Everybody works on videos and other assets. And I feel like for all content creators and content market, marketeers, that's probably a a good way of working and developing. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. And as a, a leader of a marketing and content function, are there particular skill sets and roles that you always look to keep in-house and certain ones that it's always best to outsource and work with specialists and experts in those fields? So like, where, where do you stand in terms of what's in-house, what's outsourced? I love in-house, I have to say. Yeah, yeah. I just feel like in terms of value, um, in terms of a quality of the output, I really prefer it. And, um, you know, even when we were trying new things, when we launched a podcast a couple of years ago, um, we initially had a podcast production agency to help us. It was just systematic in terms of just figuring out how we do everything ourselves. We suspected, and I think we were right, we'd get a better quality of outcome pretty quickly. We were lucky enough to have had a, a videographer work in the team over the last year or so. And um, that was something I'd conventionally always outsourced video work and hadn't had the luxury of just being able to bring a resource in-house. But, but in terms of like the, the speed of production, the quality of production, the, um, the value of having somebody with that skill set, not just in the team, but in the company. Um, and I think overall, like I haven't sat and crunched all the numbers, but the net value, I suspect, is probably much better as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's talk about one of your most memorable content marketing initiatives. So is there a standout campaign or initiative that's really memorable to you? And how did that go? What were the results? Yeah, sure. I, so I'm going to go something really recent. We did, a, we launched a DEC certification series just about sort of six weeks ago, I think now. And um, so it's, it's, you can, it sits on the Dex Hub. It's part of that thought leadership um, kind of strategy that we mentioned before. But it, it is a gated experience. You know, you have to register as a student to be able to access these courses. They're completely free. There's, there's five courses covering different areas of Dex. We, we, um, in terms of just like the execution, um, it was incredibly complex and difficult for the, the people who were, uh, Megan and Sean in our team who were, who were running this process, um, working closely with, with, um, leadership and product marketing in terms of like, um, what the content was, what the questions were, making sure they were at a proper level of, um, of credibility for the audience we were, we were aiming for. But in terms of just like 
making sure everything synced, making sure people were sent their badges after they passed the course. You know, it, there was, it was just torturously complex and, and achingly slow to get everything working in concert. And by the time, when, when you do something, by the time you, that complex and that ultimately long-winded, and by the time you launch it, you do, it, it, but you can get a bit like pessimistic, right? Like, is this even, after all of this, is it going to just like, is it, is it going to just fail? Is it going to just, do? and uh, so I'm delighted to say a few weeks later, we have over 300 students in the, in the uh, DEX uh, university, if you will. And I, and I read that Harvard Business School only admits 900 new students a year. So, you know, as a, wow. as, it's, a reasonable, <laughs> it's a reasonable sized college, right? It's a reasonable sized campus, if you did a virtual campus. And we've had, you know, um, around uh, pushing 700 completed courses. And they're quite tricky, quite difficult. So people are obviously taking multiple ones. I'm sure we had, you know, I, I had a recording a podcast the other day with a customer. And uh, we were just saying goodbye. She said, look, before you go, I want to plug your certification series. I have my whole team do them all. I'm, I'm having people who are applying for work with us, look at them, you know, so, so getting that kind of um, response after such a kind of difficult process was very nice to see, but you know how it is in content marketing. It, it's lovely to try new things and to um, challenging and, 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 and rewarding when they come up. You know? Yeah. That's amazing. That's, that's really, really interesting. What did you do to get the certification course in front of you, the ideal clients to begin with so like was it email marketing paid social like how did you do that <laughs> we've done a little bit of a, a bit of everything largely it's been email um but we have done some paid and we certainly promoted it on social and we certainly promoted it on the dex hub but um so you know the numbers have been great considering because it's not it's not had a ton of money put into it at all it's uh it's largely people come into it yeah yeah, that's awesome. I, I I can completely relate to that feeling you said you had at the point of putting it live where you sort of getting a bit pessimistic. Is it worth it? We launched a scorecard, um, like the content repurposing scorecard last summer. And uh, I think we remember us putting a jokey post out, you know, after 11,000 hours and 250 meetings and 5 million Slack messages, we've finally launched this. And you do get to that point, don't you? And then it's such a delight when actually... Hey, it's, it pays off and you can see it working. It really out. takes a long time as well. It's always been paid for out of last year's budget. It's almost like nobody's even like really scrutinizing anymore. They're like, well, the good thing is we'll probably play with it. If it just quietly uh, expires, but I very nice when it does, not it? No, that's, a, that's an excellent um, initiative. So thanks for sharing that. What about any um, cautionary tales or any funny stories of campaigns that perhaps haven't gone quite to plan. We attempted a load of vertical marketing. We've got some industries that the, the technology performs well in, but it's particularly uh, well suited to, we have some big customers in, but we have a lot of target accounts in. And we thought, like, is there a good cause to try and create content specifically for IT in the health sector, except, uh, for instance, you know? And the answer was no. And, uh, <laughs> I think, I think our, our prospects think of themselves as like IT professionals in general. They're not particularly focused on the, the sort of specific vertical that they work in. And, um, and as such, we produced a lot of content. We, we gave it our best shot and, uh, they, they couldn't have cared less about it. So we've had to quietly retire that approach. I kind of liked it because we were, we, we, colleagues were coming to us to say, look, this is, this is a big focus for us to try and get people in this. In this sector, you know, there's a, there's a, there's, there's huge reward here. Is there a way we could try and create content for them specifically? And you sometimes, you know, in content marketing, you have colleagues come to you and they just want some content to fill their list of things they've done or instigate to re to, with, as part of a release schedule or a program or, of some sort. And you do, you do look at it and you think you just, you know, what is the purpose of this content? In this instance, there was such a clear aim. You know, that it was well worth trying, even and, and you know, so it's 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 it was it was fine to do and okay to sort of cross it off the list, you know, and and, and revert to other approaches because it was had that kind of concrete intended outcome, you know. And I'm sure you know there were clear lessons learned and ways that you could repurpose some of what you've done 
to other campaigns and even if it's just the learnings and the thinking and, and you know what went into it I'm sure it wasn't completely <laughs> you, you've got to explore different angles and you've got to take bold decisions when you see that things aren't working up there haven't you so that's a good story some quick five questions to to round off our conversation so what is one takeaway tip that you would give other content marketers that are looking to really optimize their content output you know i really i see a lot of value in in the podcast at the moment and i i don't know if that's um i don't know if that's trite to say because when i when i but it feels like it it, it should be so obviously a dominant form of, of content marketing in, in organizations, I don't feel that it has reached that ubiquitous stage yet. And I think as such, there's a lot more opportunity in starting one and doing it. And that opportunity has like many, many, many different um, aspects, which I won't go into because it's a quick fire round. So that's my, that would be my, that would be my answer. Still a very, still an underused tool, despite the popularity of the podcast in general. 100% agree with you on that. What would you say is a typically overlooked or undervalued tool that you would recommend to content marketers? I would almost say like a, a something we touched upon when we came across earlier, like a willingness to bring more things in house. I know it's not a conventional tool per se, but like I think there's a lot of habitual outsourcing in marketing teams that costs more than it would, you know, at large if you take the bird's eye view to bring something in house and and ultimately is going to be a lot less successful if done via endless amounts of vendors and vendor relationships. Good one. Finally, if you could create any kind of content for the company, so we're talking about a limitless budget and access to resources as well, primetime TV show, like ad at Billboard, Times Square, what would you, what's the sky's your limit? What would you, what are you thinking? Oh, like one of those epically long Super Bowl ads. Like, you? <laughs> yeah, we always have these ideas which are like for stories and stuff our cmo has some really funny uh concept ideas and uh you know you always think well we, we find ways to work with them and stuff but you always think like well if you only had if we had like the two minute slot and like if you tens of millions of people this would really fly and uh it would be a, it would be fun wouldn't it but uh, but there it is. Since it's a limitless question, that would be my, uh, you know, astronomical uh, expend expense. If you did do this, uh, this Super Bowl ad, and like you said, we're, we're quite limitless here. Is there a celebrity that you think resonates well with the brand that you would get involved in that? <laughs> Great question. Great question. Oh, uh, I never thought about that before. <laughs> Maybe someone out of one of the great sci-fi fantasy franchises, someone who was in a, a Lord of the Rings or, or a Star Wars or something. Maybe if you wanted to hit the audience uh, with what it loves, you know. Yeah, I agree. Well, it's been an awesome conversation. It's been great finding out more about what about you and your role and your team and everything that you guys are doing. Where would you like people to go if they want to connect with you or, or find out more? Oh yeah, come say hello and connect on LinkedIn. I'm sure we can put a link in the, in the old show notes. Check out if you're you're interested in in, in podcasting or or Dex and or Dex. Check out our Dex show. Check out our uh, Dex hub if you want to look at any of those assets or initiatives that I mentioned. And of course, check out the next thing website to see our see the other side of what we do. Also, yeah, absolutely. I'll put links to everything in the show notes. And as I said, obviously doing some research into this discussion and looking at all of the content and decks and the category as you said that you're creating i certainly found it all really interesting so thank I'll, you I'll so much i so appreciate recommend. it it's nice that you occupy such a specific space and such a specific audience it's nice when somebody outside of it takes a look too you know 100 percent, yeah super interesting so i'll put links to everything so thank you tom it's been absolutely awesome so thanks for coming on b2b content strategist Pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on.